Welcome to Sound Bites, hosted by registered dietitian nutritionist Melissa Joy Dobbins. Welcome to the Sound Bites Podcast. This is a two part series on strength, the principles of strength, fueling strength, and strength in action. Ultimately, how strength can help you to be your best self. So, I interviewed three different guests. First is Dr. Mike Roussel. He's a research scientist, a protein expert, and the author of the new book, Strength the Field Manual. Second, I interviewed Amy Livingston. She's an Olympic weightlifter, food blogger, and recipe developer, and also a breast cancer survivor. And third is Lance Pekus, the Cowboy Ninja. He's a regular competitor on American Ninja Warrior and a cattle rancher with a degree in natural resources and environmental science. In these two episodes, we discuss what strength means to each guest. We talk about physical strength, but also mental and emotional strength. We discuss the four cornerstones of eating to support strength and some practical tips for tweaking your meals and snacks, as well as simple cooking ideas and meal prepping advice. And we also talk about life on a cattle ranch and how both the land and the animals are cared for. This series is a collaboration with Beef It's What's for Dinner and is part of my role as a compensated member of the Beef Expert Bureau which is a program of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, a contractor to the Beef Checkoff. So stay tuned because we talk about so much more than beef in these three interviews. I hope you'll enjoy these two episodes and be sure to check out the free book, Strength the Field Manual. Digital and hard copies are available at beefitswhatsfordinner.com. And be sure to stay tuned to the end of the episode for some announcements from my partner, the American Association of Diabetes Educators. Hello, and welcome back to the Sound Bites Podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Joy Dobbins. I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist. And on the show, I delve into the science, the psychology, and the strategies behind good food and nutrition. And today's episode is all about strength. We are talking about protein and exercise and the four corners of eating to support strength and even some lifestyle factors. My guest today is Dr. Mike Roussel. He's a nutrition consultant and the author of several nutrition books, with his latest being Strength, the Field Manual. Welcome to the show, Dr. Mike. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Well, thank you for being on and sharing all this great information that led up to your new book. We're going to talk about everything that's in the book and some of the online resources. But I'd like to share a little bit about your background and have you tell us a little bit more to fill in some of those gaps. So you uh, have a degree in biochemistry from Hobart College and a doctorate in nutrition from Penn State. And you know your broad range of experience goes from consulting with pharmaceutical and food companies, medical schools, professional athletes, you do some one-on-one clients, and you really take this experience and pull it together to translate scientific research into relevant, understandable, and actionable strategies that get results. And of course, you have, as a researcher and a scientist, you have been published multiple times in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. So tell us a little bit about how you went from biochemistry to this PhD in nutrition and also what led you down the path for maybe more of the sports and fitness aspects. I got into nutrition through sports and athletics as a kid. I remember that kind of my poignant moment was I, I tore my ACL in high school playing lacrosse and was at a supermarket the night before I had surgery, having my last meal before I needed to fast. Mm. And I picked up an, uh, a Muscle and Fitness magazine on the uh, checkout counter and never read kind of anything really fitness and nutrition related, but I was starting to get into weightlifting, like had a weightlifting set in my bedroom as a kid. That was kind of like the bug that got me. Like I was laid up for, you know, forever after surgery 
and I was just kind of became a sponge for everything fitness, uh, weightlifting and nutrition related. And so that was really the catapult was muscle magazines, which I think for for a lot of kids my age at that point, it really was was kind of pre-internet. And then, you know, I just I started to really appreciate as I went off to college, um, I was always very into science. And so, you know, I had this degree in chemistry and I focused on organic chemistry and then biochemistry. And I just found it very logical and interesting. Like one of my passions, I think, across everything with nutrition is solving problems. And I think that you can use nutrition to solve so many problems in people's lives with respects to health and mood and affect and and just all kinds of things. And understanding biochemistry really helped me understand the basis of those things. Like I kind of think that your body, it lives by a kind of a finite set of rules, you know, how things work biochemically, and then being able to understand beyond that. So I actually went to medical school right after I got my, my first degree in biochemistry, because hmm. I was like, I want to be a doctor. And went there, I, I literally did the whole nutrition curriculum, which was like five days of lectures. <laughs> So you know exactly <laughs> what doctors are getting and not getting when it yes. comes to nutrition. Yeah, it was literally, you know, like, so it was five days. And at that point, the University of Vermont, where I was going to medical school, was like ahead of the curve on their nutrition curriculum. Wow. So I did about 18 months in medical school, and I just felt like it wasn't for me. And, and I was able to, to meet uh, a great woman named Paul Tracy, who's a professor of biochemistry. And she used to give me a hard time that I didn't feel like it was better living through chemistry. And I was like, well, it's better living through chemistry, just not necessarily the chemistry of medicine, more the chemistry of food. Mm. And she happened to be in charge of the unit that nutrition was a part of for the medical school. So I decided I wanted to get my PhD. That doesn't happen instantly. So she hired me to run her lab. Uh, she had a biochemistry lab. I was able to run that. And I was also then able to help her redevelop the nutrition curriculum for medical students at the University of Vermont. So that was kind of my first foray into it. And then I went to Penn State. I was fortunate enough to work with a, a professor named Penny Chris Atherton, who's oh, yeah. she's a nutrition rock star. Yeah. <laughs> and while I was there, I was actually funny because you, you go and do something like I was very interested and still am in omega-3 fatty acids and how they impact various areas of biology. So I got to graduate school and they were like, well, you could write a grant. So I'm like, sure, I'll write a grant. But in the end, it takes a long time to write grants and get things approved. And so about halfway through my first year of graduate school, they're like, hey, we have this other study mm -hmm. that has taken so long to get funded. The student who wrote the grant has another project, like they've moved on mm. and we really need someone to run it. Would you be interested? Uh, it was called the Bold Study, um, Beef in an Optimal Lean Diet, which is basically looking at the DASH dietary pattern. If you incorporate lean beef into it, what happens? And so I was like, yeah, of course, like I was, you know, like weightlifting my whole life, like I'm, I'm all about protein and so that's how it kind of I got into beef nutrition. And then it, it is it sort of just become my life's work. I think what was a really interesting turn for me in nutrition was bodybuilders or people who are really into weightlifting. And I say this with a lot of love, like they're kind of mutants from a self-discipline perspective. Mm. You know, you could say like, hey, this is what you're doing. You're eating 200 grams of chicken and a cup of broccoli and half a cup of white rice every day. And they'll just do it. Yeah, they'll just do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then when I was at, at Penn State, we read uh, the Bold study and what our lab specialized in was controlled feeding studies mm -hmm. where the dietetic students come into the metabolic kitchen, they cook, weigh, and measure all this food. People come in every morning, your study subjects, they weigh themselves, they eat breakfast, and then they leave with a cooler of food that's all weighed and measured and everything. And then they come back and repeat the next day. And so when you do that, like, it's easy. <laughs> like, <laughs> So I sort of left graduate school thinking, you know, like, well, I got this nutrition thing figured out, right? <laughs> and so then I went and I started, I was doing all kinds of work. But one of the things that I was doing was I had a friend who ran a gym in, in New York City. And I would drive into New York once or twice a month and start uh, meeting some of the clientele there. And what I quickly realized is, you know, that bodybuilding and control feeding studies have nothing to do with actual life. <laughs> and... <laughs> and you know, so then it became a whole, you know, kind of back to solving problems. Like it mm. wasn't a matter of figuring out like what are the nutrients. It was a matter of then figuring out what's holding this person back. And then what is the thing that we could do that could make the biggest impact? Mm -hmm. Because you could sit there and I, it literally had nothing to do with my PhD. Like I could <laughs> spout a gazillion facts that they would be of no consequence mm. because it was more of a function of, you know, they weren't sleeping enough and maybe they were having too many glasses of wine and they were skipping breakfast. 
So that kind of set me on a whole other quest of wishing I had a degree in psychology. Right. And, you know, in chemistry, there's this idea of the rate limiting step of a chemical equation. Mm -hmm. It's basically like the weakest link or something. Yeah, exactly. The weakest link, like a, a group of chemical reactions can only go as fast as the slowest step or the thing you have the least amount of. And that has become a big focus for me with nutrition is figuring out like, what is the thing? Because everybody's searching for the thing, right? Yeah. That's why I think these diets that are so polarizing are so popular because you're like, oh, I'm going to cut out all of this because that's the thing. Right. And I, what I found over the years is people generally aren't able to look objectively at their own lives and say like, oh, this is the thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's like working with people to understand it's a game of consistency. Like you need to be healthy your whole life, not like next week. It's the marathon, not the sprint. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's the marathon, not the sprint. And so that's really kind of, you know, I found that my journey in nutrition has kind of come full circle into that. And so I find that it's important to understand the details of nutrition, but in actually helping people, it's much broader strokes, which, you know, kind of going back to the strength of field manual is more of that. It's more of how do we create an environment in our life and a culture around food that helps you enjoy life, but also be healthy and make the progress that you want without obsessing over details. Excellent. Well, thank you. That's a very interesting background. I chuckle a little bit when you basically said that you thought biochemistry and organic chemistry were logical, but um, everything else, I was, I was with you. I was with you. <laughs> no, it's really interesting. I, I um, have met you a couple of times briefly, but I didn't know that much about your background. And I appreciate you sharing that. With Strength, the field manual, I know that you created this in conjunction with the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, and I'm on the Beef Expert Bureau for the Beef Council. So this is a new book, and I'll just put this out there. It is a digital ebook on beefitswhatsfordinner.com, but you can also request hard copies through that website. They're free. So I encourage people to, to go to beefitswhatsfordinner.com. And I will have all these links, of course, everything in my show notes at soundbitesrd.com. But there's three parts to the book. There's part one is the principles of strength. Part two is fueling strength. And part three is strength in action. So tell us a little bit about how you decided what you wanted to put in the book and really kind of the nitty gritty about what's in the book. Previously, the book that I wrote prior to this one was called The Medishra Diet that uh, Men's Health had published. And it's actually, it's sort of the polar opposite of this. It is, it's a very scripted four to eight week weight loss plan where there are recipes and you follow, it's more of that traditional controlled feeding model, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, you know, that's valuable. Sometimes that's what people want to do. But with this uh, Strength of Field Manual, you know, the idea of strength was looking at it beyond just like physical strength. And it's more in line with what, with what I was talking about before. It's like, how do you help people eat in a way that supports their overall life? And maybe more accessible to most people versus this sort of elite group who, like you said, they'll do these kind of strict regimens and this is not that. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's totally the, like the Metastra diet, for example, is the right book for a certain amount, a certain group of people. Mm -hmm. And I have this idea called the stages of nutrition, that people are along different stages of their journey of nutrition. Like the base stage is called nutritional freestyling, where you just are kind of eating whenever you want. You, you know, you're you hungry, you eat, you, you walk by a pizza place, it smells good, you go in and get a slice. Like there's no rhyme or necessarily reason to what you're doing. And I feel like where people and maybe nutrition has failed people is you take someone like that and you say, well, the only way for you to lose weight is to count all your calories and macronutrients and to get these results. But the behavior difference between those two areas of the spectrum is so tremendous. Mm. And so the goal of Strength of Field Manual was to more just someone who in their life is nutritional freestyling. Maybe they, they kind of know about healthy eating and they have a good idea of what to do, but they feel like they need to do all these details and specifics. And there's a lot in between. <laughs> There's a, Yeah, exactly. There's a lot in between. And and if you try to go from nutritional freestyling to then what I call like stage four, which is this detailed macronutrient counting, what falls apart is what I, I call food logistics. Like how do you get the right food in front of you at the right times? Mm. 
that's really what fueling strength and strength in action, those sections are about, is figuring out how do you get those foods in front of you. So strength of field manual, I looked at it as like I have four young kids and looking at like if someone like myself or like my wife, you know, wanted to start eating healthy and living a better life, what would be a valuable resource for them? Like I'm not going to weigh and measure how many grams of vegetables I'm eating every day. It's just not in the cards. Mm -hmm. And I would also say it's not necessary. And I also, you know, as part of the thing with the book, I wanted to people generally think, well, I have to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, like that's the only option. And they feel like, you know, weighing and measuring and counting macronutrients, that there's a merit to that. And I always say, look, it's important to figure out what you want with your life, like from a health perspective. And then let's just do whatever we need to do that. Like I have a, a good friend who's a, a strength coach in California, and he always joked about having a client that came to him and said, I want to exercise as little as possible, eat as bad as possible, but look as good as possible. That sounds pretty relatable. Right? Yes. And I'm like, you know, I think honestly, that's what people <laughs> want to do. Like if you could exercise 150 minutes a week and have the health and energy that you want, then why would you exercise 500 minutes a week? Mm-hmm. You know, because I think that as a nutrition professional, like I love nutrition and it's my life's work, but I don't expect it to be anybody else's life's work. Like they just want to eat to do what they got to do. So the idea behind the book was to empower people to do that, was to show like here are examples, you know, like Lance Pekas, who's an American Ninja Warrior competitor. We have a profile on him in the book. And, you know, he does this, like this Ninja Warrior, but he also has all kinds of other responsibilities in his life. And we actually, I profiled some other protein researchers who are, are friends and colleagues to show even them who their life's work is protein research that they have this much more moderate view on how to keep track of food, how to be consistent, because they understand and appreciate the long term, or like you said, like the marathon of nutrition. So it was about helping people understand the marathon of nutrition, and then also give them tools to actually move forward. Mm -hmm. Because not having the tools or not feeling like you know what to do. So it's like, okay, I understand I need to, I understand the importance of protein. But now, how do I do that? Right, exactly. Connecting those dots. And and this book, like you said, I mean, it's geared towards a very broad group of people, you know, families, active people, anyone who just wants to improve their nutrition. This isn't, I mean, strength, which we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. But this certainly isn't, you know, just for athletes or just for fitness buffs or even just people who want to trim up a little bit, it, you know, on the front of the book, there's a picture of a man holding a baby up in the air. So it's about food and fitness and kind of living your best life. And I talk a lot on the podcast about quality of life. Like you said, you know, can we eat as healthy as we can? Can we be active? Can we do the things that we want to do and not spend an inordinate amount of time counting, tracking, monitoring being so detail oriented. But to your point, and I agree with this approach that that you had shared with me prior to the interview, is that it is helpful for people to kind of get a grasp of where they are now so that they can make those incremental changes. So a little bit of tracking or monitoring, maybe for one person, it might be with a pen and paper or for someone else, it might be with an app or something, but just maybe paying attention a little bit more to what their day-to-day habits are so that they can make those changes moving forward. But let's talk a little bit about what strength means to you, what strength, the focus in the book on strength is about, because it's not just about muscles. Yeah, it's not just about muscles. And and I think you had a great point about the cover. We were trying to portray strength in a variety of ways, not just muscular strength, which if I would have wrote this book seven years ago, it probably would have come out a lot different because my definition of strength would have been much more muscular strength. You know, that's really the primary strength focus. But this is really about strength in your lives in a variety of ways. So muscular strength, because that is important across the entire life cycle. You know, while muscular strength is maybe even more important to someone who's 65 or 70 as it is to someone who's 20. Mm -hmm. You know, mental strength, I think we generally underappreciate the impact of stress on our mental strength and and our overall health it's like how do we even at a at a young age how do we provide our bodies the nutrients that are needed to help build mental strength and then kind of through the life cycle again as you get older what else needs to happen to help maintain that mental strength 
you know, people eat food not for calories, a lot more reasons than for energy. And so there's a social strength that comes from eating meals together. You know, with my family, like we try to eat our family, you know, like dinner together almost every day during the week, because I think that there's a social strength to that. So, it, you know, strength is empowering, like you've said, living your best life, but it, it's all these different components. It's physical, it's mental, it's, it's a relationship sort of strength. And then having the, the strength or the fortitude to do that every day. So creating a plan that, that empowers you to do it every single day, not just for a week or, or a couple of days at a time. Thank you. Yeah. So clearly protein um, and strength, we kind of associate those two things. But yeah, I totally appreciate the more holistic approach about mental strength and that that day-to-day consistency and um, energy, but not in the sense of calories, but vitality comes to mind as well. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about protein. And then we are going to talk about the four cornerstones of eating to support strength, because it's not just protein. Um, but I've talked a lot about protein on the show, but it's kind of been a while. It's it's funny. You mentioned some of the protein researchers that are profiled in the book. One of them, Doug Patton Jones, was actually on episode number one of my Soundbites podcast. He was the first person that I interviewed. I think it's called The Power of Protein. And I just loved talking with him, had a great interview with him. Um, if anybody goes back and listens, the content's great. I'm sure the audio is horrible, but you know, things grow and change over uh, yep. four and a half years. And then also another protein researcher, he's not in, he's not profiled in your book, but I'm sure you know him, Stuart Phillips. Um, way back in episode 39, we talked about protein and exercise being powerful partners in aging. And I've touched on protein a lot here and there. I did a protein challenge a few years ago with the Beef Council and was trying to get a little bit more protein, but also that redistribution, which we can talk about as well and and see where the research is on that. We tend to not get much at breakfast and maybe more than we need at dinner. But if we kind of redistribute that, things are better. So I wanted to throw those out in case anybody wants to, to check out some of those other episodes. Tell me a little bit about where things are now with protein and specifically beef's protein, since you worked on this book with the Beef Council. How does the protein and the specific beef protein play a role in the strength field manual in active lifestyles? So protein, you know, I'm sure that Doug and Stu would have both touched on this. I recommend your listeners go back and read to those because they're both brilliant and also entertaining people to listen to and talk to. You know, one of the things, and we call it the, you mentioned the four cornerstones of a diet, or I had called it like the four cornerstones of a strong diet is protein at every meal, or I call it anchor your plate with protein. Because protein is is a unique from a a food and nutrient perspective in that there is a timing associated with your body. So protein research, and you were saying this about spacing out your meals, spacing out protein, you know, your body can only, for the sake of building and repairing muscle, you can only strengthen those signals in your body so much in a given time. So by eating protein at every single meal, that allows you to maximize those signals versus if you didn't eat a protein all day and then you had a big protein meal. So they've kind of done those research studies and showed that it's better if you space it out. Mm -hmm. And in today's protein, protein is like so hot. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It's like almost as hot as ketogenic diets, but (laughs) maybe maybe not not that hot, (laughs) right? So, you know, people are like, you got to eat more protein, got to eat more protein. Whereas then you have like certain dietary recommendations or organizations will say, we're eating too much protein. And so like, what, you know, what do you do? Right. Well, let me just ask you real quick. What do you think when you hear that people are eating too much protein? I think that, honestly, I think that we are in a stage with nutrition as a key piece of information publishing. I think the internet has empowered people to produce content and information all the time, but that there's only so much you can talk about. Mm. And so what ends up happening is people start arguing over very specifics. So they take a general concept like, are people eating enough protein? And then they would talk about it in a very specific use case Mm. to produce a piece of content. So I think a great example is, are people eating too much protein? And then you would hear someone say like, yes, the RDA for protein is, you know, 56 grams per day for a male. And the average, you know, people are eating about 90 to 100 grams of protein per day. We're eating almost twice as much protein as we need. And that just confuses people because the color that's missing 
is that the RDAs are defined to help reduce you know, disease, so to fight an uh, essential amino acid deficiency. And so, yes, at 100 grams of protein per day, you're definitely, you're not going to be short on essential amino acids. But most people are not looking to just be not frail, right? <laughs> or like on the other side of... Just be not sick and not... Yeah, not sick. Yes, not sick. And so it's like, you know, what's optimal? And I think that's a question, you know, with beef protein that's being asked in a research setting and has been for years now. And that's more the important question. Like, what's the optimal amount of protein in your diet? And one of the things with Strength the Field Manual, I think that was also the theme is like, what's the optimal nutrition approach for your life? So you could count calories and weigh and measure food, but that's not really, that might not be optimal for your life because there are give and takes. Like if you do that, you're not gonna be able to do other things. Mm -hmm. So I think then when you hear people say, well, you can only consume so much protein and then your body wastes it. It's like, well, that's not necessarily the case either. Like what we know is that when it comes to, like I said before, the signals that your body produces to build and repair muscle, only so much protein is needed to maximize those signals. And then after that, your body's going to use protein for other stuff. Maybe it's going to turn it into carbohydrates. Maybe it's going to use it just the raw kind of like Lego building blocks to support muscle. But you are more free to consume calories from other places. And so I think really what the research shows us based on how people are eating and the amount of protein people need to optimize muscle mass and health, people generally eat enough protein. They just need to eat it differently. Mm. You had inferred people eating more at dinner and less at breakfast. So if you're eating 100 to 120 grams of protein a day, depending on your body size, if you're not eating any at breakfast, then shifting some of what you're eating to breakfast would be the right thing to do. So your total amount of protein might not actually change, but how you're eating it and when would change. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the questions that the last time, which maybe like almost a year ago, like eight months ago, when I saw Doug Patton Jones, we were talking about protein is interesting because you get these recommendations that people will make on a meal basis. You know, like you need 30 grams of protein, which is about a little bit larger than the palm of your hand of protein. Mm -hmm. But then protein also has these, like when we we're talking about the RDA, it has like a grams per pound body weight recommendation. And then it also has a percent calorie recommendation. <laughs> so it's like, if we couldn't confuse you enough, Let's throw some more math into the equation. Exactly. To somebody who's listening, you're thinking like, well, 30% of my calories for protein, like what does that even mean? I mean, that's almost as like uh, far out fantasiful as like eating 1500 milligrams of sodium. Like, how do you measure that? <laughs> um, and so I had said to, you know, I was talking with Doug, I'm like, look, like what do you, like your life is literally protein. How do you make up the difference? So the difference between, you know, a gram per pound body weight and 100 to, you know, say 100 grams of protein per day, you know, for somebody that's, there's going to be a difference there that could be anywhere between 30 to 80 grams of protein, let's say. Mm. And I was like, how do you make up the difference in that recommendation? His take was candidly, like, I don't think it matters. Mm. Because he's like, there are so many other things that people do on a, like on a daily, weekly, monthly basis that would impact their lean body mass that whether you eat 130 or 160 grams of protein is just going to kind of wash. Mm -hmm. He gives the example of you're out running, you twist your knee, and then you don't run then for four or five weeks because you're injured. And so that sedentary nature that you would then embrace for four or five weeks is going to do more damage to you than if you were to eat the 130 grams of protein versus 160. You know, like there are just, there are larger factors in your life at play and it's not necessarily about those details in protein. So I thought that was interesting as someone who's like a weightlifting, give me the data yeah. person at heart. It made me a little bit uncomfortable, mm. but you know, I see his point because I, I see it with people. One of the things that I've been able to be really fortunate with, with the clients that I work with kind of on a one-on-one -on -one basis our relationships last years. Mm. And so being able to see changes that you can make in someone's diet and things that you can do and that impact, not just in a two week span, but in like an 18, 24 month span, you know, seeing an effect or even not seeing an effect, I think is really interesting. And, and I think that was true to what Doug was saying is that we can, even that level of detail, which seems like a big gap is small based on a lot of other lifestyle factors that, that impact health. Mm -hmm.
Right. And to your point, I know you recommend eating protein at every meal. You said, you know, anchor your plate with protein. Just doing that, regardless of how much is on that plate, is a big change for a lot of people, whether that's animal protein or plant protein or whatever, especially, you know, we talked about breakfast. That tends to be the meal where we just, because of the typical food choices that we make at those day parts, we would tend to get less protein and sometimes no protein at breakfast. So yeah, going back to the four cornerstones, you know, you're saying anchor your plate with protein. You start with that. And then what are the other cornerstones? I think your point is great about if you focus on anchoring your plate with protein, it's generally a big change for people. And I think it also, it sets your plate up differently. Like if you think of a meal of like, well, what's the protein piece that's going to center this meal? Then the end result of that dish is generally different. Whereas if you were to say, I'm going to start with a plate of pasta, and then how do you build around that? And I will qualify this with this is more my feeling on the translation of behavior, not necessarily research. Um, but that's just kind of how I see it play out. Yeah. Or like, you know, I'm just thinking, oh, I'm hungry. It's it's breakfast time. I'll grab some cereal and milk or something like that. Nothing wrong with that. But I might grab Greek yogurt and put cereal in it if I'm starting by thinking about protein. Yeah, that's totally right. Yeah, that's exactly it. It just shifts. I think it shifts the overall nutrient quality of what that meal could be. Mm-hmm. If you start with that question. In addition to also, I think, setting you up physiologically for a win for the rest of the day. You know, the next thing is that you pair protein with your plants. So it's basically then how do we get more fruits and vegetables on our plate? So you're starting with protein and then you fill out the rest of your plate with that. You know, that's probably, like I mentioned, I have four little kids. Like, that's like my life's biggest struggle. (laughs) How do you make fruits and vegetables interesting? You know, spinach has a much lower marketing budget than Pepsi, so it's hard to get it's hard to get people excited about it. So, you know, then looking at now I'm doing plants because this is an area I think vegetables are an area that are generally underappreciated by people. It's more of something that people feel like they have to do. But when you incorporate it then as kind of the second step of what am I going to put here, it adds volume to your plate. It adds nutrients to your plate. You're ensuring that you're getting you know, these kind of lower calorie, higher nutrient dense foods onto your meal. And so always looking at how do we pair, you know, these plants or vegetables or in fruits with the protein that's already on our plate. Yeah. And I have to say, you know, I mean, we all know that we're not getting enough fruits and vegetables. Almost nobody is. And that we need more fruits and vegetables. I recently did a podcast episode on the new Have a Plant campaign with Wendy Reinhardt Kapsack, the CEO of the Produce for Better Health Foundation. Mm -hmm. And she's phenomenal. I'm sure you've probably met her. She's an amazing speaker. And we just had a really interesting conversation about the new campaign. And I encourage people, obviously, to to go listen to the episode. But a couple things stuck out. Well, first of all, she told me the backstory and the behind the scenes on how they came up with Have a Plant, which I'll be honest, I was not overexcited when I heard the slogan. I was kind of like, what? Well, I'm not a millennial, so that could be part of the the reason. Um, But when she explained the backstory and the inside scoop, it made a lot of sense to me and I got more excited about it. And also she talks about how the research is showing fruits and vegetables. We lump them all together. We always talk about fruits and vegetables, but they have two very different personalities. And so if we're trying to get people to have more produce in their diet... We might want to think about the different personalities that fruits and vegetables have. So I'm just going to leave that as a teaser and people can go to the episode for more information. No, I think, you know, that's a really great point about fruits and vegetables. When I was at Penn State, there was a professor there and her name is escaping me right now. And she did a lot of work with nutrition education and she did a lot of work with the SNAP program in Pennsylvania. And, you know, that was one of her things. She's like, you know, people say eat your fruits and vegetables, but like, fruit and vegetables are two totally different things. Yeah. That, I mean, that's like saying drink milk and orange juice. Like they're liquid, <laughs> they're like they're liquid, but they're like totally different. So yeah, no, I think that's a great point. You know, one of the other things I think about and why I had this as kind of the second cornerstone with plants or produce and vegetables is I always, I have this negative reaction where I feel like protein and plants are always at odds with one another. Yes. And Yes, I eat protein at every meal and, and I you know eat a fair amount of beef throughout the week, but I also eat more vegetables than anyone I know. Mm. And when we ran the BOLD study, 
one of the diets was a higher protein diet. And I apologize for now referring on a percent calorie basis, but it was 30% calories. About <laughs> what does that as, mean? <laughs> exactly. So it's not twice as much. Not like in popular diet terms, you could imagine this is like the zone diet, right? Mm-hmm. And so it was a little more protein, a little less carbohydrates, mm-hmm. but like not low, low, like right, moderate. Not extreme, right. So what we had to do in order to match that nutrient profile was we had to reduce some of the starches and grains and increase the vegetables. And so one of the things we would hear back from the people that would come in when they were on that diet arm is they were like, man, that's so much, so much fruits and vegetables. Like I can't eat all this food. <laughs> what was funny about this was we were also maintaining these people's weights. So it was like we were doing everything we could. It's, it's something these people never thought they would complain about. Like there was so much food, they couldn't finish it to maintain their body weights. Wow. But, you know, that group was eating a ton of vegetables. You know, they were also eating a fair amount of protein, but they were eating so many vegetables that they don't need to be opposites. And I don't understand why, other than it's fun to have like a hero and an enemy, like why there is such headbutting between protein and and plants, because it, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, biologically and from a culinary standpoint, I'm so glad you brought that up because I recently co-authored a blog post with Dr. Keith Ayub on the power of plants and animals together. And again, when we're talking about protein, you know, you're talking about anchoring your plate with protein. It doesn't necessarily mean animal protein, but it certainly could. And um, that's all good. And when you put those things together, so not just for human health, but for the health of the planet. So I'll put a link to that blog post. It's called Reduce, Reuse, Upcycle, Connecting the Dots Between Healthy People and a Healthy Planet. So we explain what upcycling is, for those of you who haven't heard that term before. And we talk about how, yes, there's synergies between plants and animals that makes a lot of sense for human health and a lot of sense for environmental health. So thank you for bringing that up. I agree. Yeah, no, that's awesome. So then the next, later, the third cornerstone was to focus on fiber-rich carbohydrates. And one of the things that I really wrestled with when I was thinking about and developing the concepts in the book was how to deal with carbohydrates in a positive way. Because I think that like the whole good, bad carbohydrate thing is not helpful for anyone. Mm-hmm. Partly because so much of it is perception, not necessarily science. Mm-hmm. Like if you were to actually look at the difference between a Coke and a Gatorade nutritionally, they're a lot more similar than you would want to believe. You know, like <laughs> it would make you really, if you were like being truly honest with yourself, it would make you very uncomfortable with how similar they were. <laughs> but people think about them very differently. Yeah. And so, you know, I wanted to be like, look, we're not necessarily, I, I definitely, I'm not demonizing any food. I think that's a big part of the book. And I would say my ongoing life struggle as a parent is not to demonize any sort of food for my kids so that they have like a nice, open, healthy idea about food in general. So I didn't want to demonize these carbohydrates and thinking, well, what's important? Because one of the other things that I also noticed with helping people with their nutrition is everybody knows what not to do. Mm -hmm. Like, it's like my kids, like they know all the things they're not supposed to do. doesn't mean they don't do them, but they know what they shouldn't do. And people know the foods that they shouldn't eat or, or should minimize. And so it's a lot more difficult to tell people what they should do instead and to help give them strategies on what to do. And so with the third cornerstone talking about focusing on fiber-rich carbohydrates is an action step that they can do. So it's not necessarily avoid refined grains, but if you're focusing on fiber-rich carbs, you're by definition then going to minimize these other less healthful carbohydrate-based foods. And then really just taking those, looking at more fiber-rich carbs, and then adding them in more around activity and using them to help kind of scale your total calorie intake to meet your energy needs. Right. And we know that we need more fiber, just like the produce. We know that we need more. And thanks for explaining that focus on fiber rich carbs. Your reasoning is really helpful because we talk about whole grains versus refined grains. I think when you just focus on the fiber, it kind of levels the playing field and it's not whole grains are good. Refined grains are bad. It's like, you know, you just want to try to get some fiber in those grains. And to me, that just takes the the good and the bad out of it and the judgment and it just keeps your eye on the prize. Yeah. And I think that I have forever struggled with the term whole grains Mm -hmm. because I don't know, I'm kind of like, well, what is the actual benefit? Because to me, the benefit in a whole grain comes from fiber and then also some of the nutrients. But then when like whole grains are like 
it's like a sh- fat free foods, you know, used to be. And then it was like, we need to make everything fat free. So then companies figured out, like, how do we make cookies fat free? Right. And so it's still a cookie. It's still a cookie. It's like, so with like whole grains, then companies figured out, well, how do we make these other foods like, you know, sugar loop O's? Like, how do we make those whole grains? All it doesn't necessarily cookies, make whole grain cookies, yeah, right? Yeah. Exactly. Whole grain cookies. Like, it doesn't. My wife and my daughter have celiacs. We joked we've been gluten free before it was cool. Ah. And. You know, just because something like the evolution of seeing gluten free, I think is a great example that just because it's gluten free, it definitely doesn't mean it's good for you. Right. I mean, if anything, the carbs they use to make gluten free cookies, crackers and breads are worse for you mm-hmm. because they're like hyper refined. So whole grains to me was it's just not a good tangible term. And that's really why I settled on fiber. Yeah. Fiber is something that people can see. Beans have a lot of fiber. You know, a good bread has a lot of fiber right. that it, it's it's an easier thing for people to get a grasp on. Right. And thank you for saying beans, because I realized earlier I said fiber rich grains, but your third cornerstone is focus on fiber rich carbs and the beans would be in that, too. Yeah. No, no. I think I, I too, default think starches and grains. I probably said that, too, but I'm a huge bean. <laughs> I, put, I put beans in the carb category personally anyway. But um, well, yeah, they're yeah. great. You could put them in the protein, the carbs, the vegetable. You can, you know, check off three boxes with that. Well, this is totally a tangent if we have time for it. I was giving uh, oral testimony at the dietary guidelines for the like the last round of dietary guidelines. Congratulations. Thank you. And before me, there was a person from the lentil council or, or group. Mm-hmm. And she got up to say that lentils are technically pulses. <laughs> now you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so confused now. <laughs> well, no, I, yeah, no, because I'm like, and she was saying how that there needed to be recommendations for beans were great, but that we needed recommendations for pulses because they were different. And... I feel like thinking like, come on, like we're talking lentils here. Don't be greedy. Like no, you know, nobody's like, if we start telling people that lentils aren't beans, like it's going to be like, no one's going to know what to do for anything. <laughs> right. um, so we're splitting hairs. Oh my gosh. Exactly. We can't. No, I love my lentils. I've worked with the lentil, uh, Canadian lentils before. I did a TV segment on it. They're awesome. They're great. But yeah, we just need more of those and more of beans and legumes. Yeah, I'm a huge, my mission is to find good ways to cook lentils for my kids. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, I'm a big lentil fan. Awesome. Yeah, I made double chocolate cupcakes with lentils. And I made it for this TV segment. And of course, I taste tested it on my family and my son, who I think was nine at the time, he was like, these are really good. I'm like, hey, if your (laughs) nine-year-old likes lentils, cupcakes, you're all good. Definitely. And then the fourth cornerstone is fuel recovery to be stronger. And so that focused more on the role of protein in muscle recovery. So having some protein either before or after your workout to support muscle recovery, and then using carbohydrates and also, you know, the electrolytes that come within healthy foods help help with recovery after exercise so that you're we're ready to go the next time. Like I think we've, you know, we kind of generally underappreciate the role of whole foods in exercise recovery. Mm. You know, um, the American College of Sports Nutrition, their guidelines for after exercise are really just to eat fruits, vegetables and, and, and whole foods that you don't necessarily need a sports recovery drink to get those electrolytes that they're plentiful in a diet. So if you can just eat a healthy diet and get those carbohydrates to replenish your sugar stores and your muscles, to jumpstart muscle recovery with protein, that you know, you're going to recover adequately. Is it more about the timing then? I think it's about timing and it's also about intensity. Mm. One of the things that with exercise studies is they're done in a variety of like, I think nutrition research can be confusing, but like exercise research is even more confusing Hmm. because the different modalities, durations, types of intensity, like there's so many variables and it goes back to, you know, kind of the people using specific details to argue broad general points Hmm. that if you exercise three days a week for, you know, an hour, let's say you do, you weight lift or do some sort of higher intensity training, like that's a much different load than someone in a research study who had to sprint downhill until they couldn't move. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you know, so yes, giving that person a recovery drink helped fight muscle damage and do all those other things. But for you, if you were to just eat dinner and have it be a well-rounded meal, then you would be good to go. Hmm. But I think, you know, people are generally often looking for like, well, what is this? What is this supplement that I need? Or what's this extra drink that I need to you know, to give me that extra edge or to make sure that 
I'm not holding myself back. But I generally find that most people don't exercise at a high enough volume or intensity on an ongoing basis that they require all sorts of special supplementation and kind of drinks and beverages. I think branched chain amino acid supplements, I think, are a great example. Mm. Branched chain amino acids are, are a specific kind of essential amino acid. And they've been around forever in a, in a supplement form. They used to just be big like horse pills in the 90s. But now they're like delicious drinks that you can have. And that's really caught on. But there's really no evidence to show that there is a big benefit. If your muscles were Legos and you had a branched chain amino acid drink, that would be only having like a couple Legos to build a whole house. Like you need lots of Legos. Like that's why you need like an actual piece of protein um, to give you all of that. Hmm. I think one of the things, and, and this is, you know, with kind of conversations with, with I've had with Doug Patton Jones and, and also uh, Heather Lighty, who's another protein researcher who we highlight in the book, mm-hmm. is, you know, that those basics of just consistency are missed in a world where everybody's trying to get, trying to sell you something. And so they can, they kind of hit these pain points and, and people don't want to miss out on the next tool they need to take their body or their recovery to the next level. But in reality, you get the same effect from, you know, just being consistent and eating a well-rounded diet. Yeah. They think these supplements are the thing, like you said earlier. Yeah. There's a great book. The author escapes me at the moment, but it's called Good to Go. And it's about the science of exercise recovery, mm. science slash marketing of exercise recovery. And the author takes this a one, she's just an incredible science writer, and like this walk through all these different things that people are doing to recover from exercise. You know, whether it's nutrition or cryo chambers or foam rolling or sensory deprivation tanks, and and in the end, she's kind of like, eh, it's all kind of smoke and mirrors. That you need to sleep more, you need to listen to your body. And, you know, if you feel like something's helping, the mental like psychology of you thinking it's working is probably the biggest effect. And I think there's a lot to that with nutrition as well. Interesting. I'll put the, I'll find that and I'll put the link in my show notes at soundbitesrd.com. I do have to say, though, for this section of the book, if people are interested, it is very interesting. And there is some detailed information about the recovery. And I feel like I could have used this when I did my triathlon five years ago, because I, I've i always lifted, well, I shouldn't say always, I've lifted weights since undergrad, and I've danced ballet my whole life. Well, there was a 25-year hiatus in there, but I've been back to it for many years now. And it wasn't until I did the longer runs, like, you know, 10K, 15Ks, and training for a triathlon, that I felt depleted or mm-hmm. hungry or like I needed something and I had no clue what I was doing. Uh, so I could have used this then. So... If I do another one, I'll be sure to to use your tips. <laughs> in the book, there's a great kind of graphical flow chart to help you understand what your recovery needs are. You know, thinking of like how long you exercise, the intensity of your exercise. Was it hot? Were you sweating? That all those things are just kind of simple checkpoints to then figure out like, do you need to do anything special or different with respects to recovery? But making those little differences is really important. I don't, I don't mean to be, that sound like this wacko nutrition generalist. I think these, that these details are important, but it's just plugging them in at the right times. Yeah. When you need it and when you don't, um, knowing that you don't need to overthink it, it can be simple as long as you kind of, yeah, this is a nice flow chart in here. The book also has a section and this is in the strength in action It has uh, some information about meal prep and modular meals. And I'm speaking with my Beef Expert Bureau colleague, Amy Livingston, about all the culinary aspects of this. But um, if there's anything you wanted to speak to with regard to the strength in action section to share with us. And also, I want to ask about uh, when you're with your family, sometimes I talk about my do more with dinner initiative. And so I'd love to hear how you do more with dinner with your family. Yeah. So, you know, with the strength in action and the meal prep, you're having Amy on. Amy's phenomenal. She's much more of a meal prep expert than I am. But I think that that's a big key for nutrition is preparation. Because this idea, which I'd mentioned before, of food logistics, like how do you get the right foods in front of you at the right times? That's a huge piece. That's the missing piece for so many people, because that helps drive consistency of your diet. In this section, I shared some things that I use and have used with people over the years that are really simple. So modular meals is a very basic idea of we take the cornerstones of 
of a healthy diet. So we say protein, plants, and, and starches or grains. And if you have a couple of those options in your house, then you can essentially mix and match those things to make a variety of meals. So that's one way to do really simple meal prep is you have one or two proteins, you have a couple different kinds of vegetables, maybe just one or two starches, and then you can make almost an infinite number of combinations. Because what I found is that, and there's actually some data from the Framingham Heart Study that shows this, that people generally eat the same things. While mm -hmm. there's this desire for variety, variety then actually leads to increases in complexity. You know, like the more variety there is, the more complicated it gets. So that people like to know that variety is possible, but still in the end like to eat the same stuff. This idea of modular meals allows you to do that. There's a consistency in the foods, but a variety in the combinations of how you do it. You know, that's kind of a tried and true thing that, that I've used over the years. One of the things, you know, we call it strength the field manual was a field manual is something that's like very practical. And so I tried to make the book as practical as possible. Um, and this section is really heavy on practicality and recipes and, and things like that. Yeah, there's some great recipes. And I love the modular meals approach. You know, it's sort of like cook once, eat twice, or even eat three times. Like, you know, the first night you might have a lean steak with broccoli and some rice. And the next night you might turn that into tacos or put it in a casserole or put it in soup or any combination of things. So it's not exactly the same, yeah. but it, you know, it's the foods that your family likes and you're repurposing it. And that also cuts down on food waste, which I'm a, a big proponent of. Me too. I hate food waste. Cutting down on it, yes. obviously not. Yeah. Um, go food waste, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. And no one ever. Um, right. One other one in there that I think is just worth mentioning is I call them one pot meals, mm. which is just something like that you can make it in one pot and then have multiple servings. So, you know, soups, stews, chilies, a fried rice, something like that, that you can make in a big thing and batch. Paul Keita is the nutrition and uh, food editor at Men's Health, and he calls it a movie meal. So like, what's something that you can put together and then go watch a movie mm -hmm. and then have it still be cooking and preparing and then oh. you have multiple meals. So I was like, but wait, we're not supposed to eat in front of the yeah, screen. No, no. You mean while it's cooking? While it's cooking. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. So you could go. Okay. Uh, I love it. Watch a movie while it cooks and then come back and then you have a variety of, of servings. Yeah, that's my kind of cooking is, yeah, the big pot of stew or whatever. And then, yeah, you can eat a lot of it the first day. You can refrigerate or freeze the rest of it in individual containers, label it, put the date on it. You're all good. Yeah. Yeah, there's also a two-day meal plan strategy. Let's talk briefly about habits before we wrap up because I know we kind of started with that, with lifestyle and mindset. Um, and I talk about behavior change a lot on the show. It's that psychology part that I mentioned in the intro. To your point, it's kind of a big piece of the puzzle. So what did you focus on in the book? And what did you what do you want people to know when it comes to lifestyle habits that build strength? So before I forget, we should go back to the do more with dinner because I have some... Oh, yeah, 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 yes. I can talk habits quickly. So I think one of the things that's really important for the listeners to really grasp is that it's much better to start slower because you're going to underestimate how hard it is to consistently build new habits. One of the things that I, I struggle, once I had the epiphany that life was in control feeding studies and bodybuilders, <laughs> then you know one of the struggles that I had with clients was having them leave a meeting and being like, well, wait, that's it? Like, that's all I have to do it, because, you know, we would come up with these very basic one or two basic strategies. Like we need to focus on doing protein at breakfast and here are the strategies. Let's really nail this. Plus one other thing that they were almost disappointed that that's all they were working on. But then in the end, they underappreciated how hard it was to actually eat protein at breakfast every day if that was something you never did. And so, you know, with habits, it's important to start slow and really hold yourself accountable to it. Like say, hey, this is, you know, I gave a talk in Texas once to a, a group of probably 80 dietitians. It was actually with Doug Patton Jones and, and Dr. Heather Lighty, and it was all about protein. And when people were talking afterwards, you know, about things that they learned or things they need to work on, 80% of the room who were all nutrition professionals said they felt like they needed to do a better job of eating protein at breakfast. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think it's just like, it's a difficult thing to work into your life if you're not used to it. So when it comes to habits, you really have to start slow, try to find something that you're doing already and modify it to make it a little bit better. 
So if you can do something a little bit better, that's a lot easier than starting something totally fresh. Mm-hmm. You know, so if, if you don't eat breakfast at all, picking what's an easy breakfast that you know you could do consistently is probably step one. Mm-hmm. Whereas maybe you're a breakfast eater and you have like maybe an egg and a glass of milk or something else for breakfast. And you're thinking, well, I need to get this a little bit more protein. How could I do that? You know, that's kind of tweaking something that's okay and making it better. And in that case, you know, one of the strategies in the book I have is is dinner for breakfast. So let's say, you know, you had some sirloin at dinner, you save a couple slices, and then you have it at breakfast. It's an easy way to get you an extra 10 or 15 grams of protein at breakfast that'll probably put you over the top of, of what you need. So, you know, small wins is basically that. It's finding something you're doing pretty good, and then let's let's make it better. I love that. Tracking your consistency is like so important with habits. We as humans do a really good job on Friday evening of remembering all the great things we did with our diets on Monday, but we forget like all the things that we kind of let slide on Tuesday and Wednesday. And I think having a written record, whether it's a photo food journal or just check marks in a box or on a piece of paper, like whatever it is, just having some tangible objective thing that you can look at and say, here's what I was working on and here was my performance is really important. Yeah, I think people think that if they're going to track their food and beverages, that it's got to be all or nothing. And so to your point, let's say you're trying to get more protein or you're trying to get more fruits and vegetables, just track that. And you know, you can even put an X on your calendar every time you have a produce serving or something like that. You can totally. make it however you want so that it's easy. No, that's is exactly what I mean. The other thing which I think is is super interesting and very effective is to plan your failures. So there was a really interesting study with women in exercise. They gave a group of women education on why they should exercise and how to exercise. And then they gave another group the same education, but then also a journal. And in the journal, they needed to write about when in their plan to exercise, were they not going to do it? So figuring out what's the point in your day where this is going to go off the rails. Mm. And then what would you do instead? So if you knew at the end of the day, you weren't going to exercise because you're going to have to work late because of meeting, like that's a common thing in your life. Then planning in advance, well, like, what would you do instead, instead of just not doing anything? And that those women who had the journal and were kind of actively reflecting and making plans ended up exercising twice as much as the women who were just given education. Because they were solving problems. Yeah, exactly. So I think one of the things to look at when you're thinking about, here's my new habit, is to also then say, well, when am I going to not do this? And what's going to be the cause of that? And how could I, you know, how could I make up for it? So if you're thinking of protein at breakfast, it could be because I'm not going to have, I'm not going to have any protein. So, you know, what's a shelf stable, easy thing that you could always have on hand? Or could you prepare it in advance? Or just kind of thinking in your own life, the troubleshooting, like it's, it's fun to think about all the good that's going to happen with your nutrition, and your diet, but spending a little bit of time on negative preparation you know, the research shows really has big dividends. Um, so that's something else that I would recommend that, that the listeners do. I love that. I love how you framed it up too, because I've talked about barriers before and, you know, kind of anticipating them, but this is really, you know, like, okay, when is this not going to happen and why and breaking that apart? I love it. You mentioned your do more dinner initiative. And, and I had said earlier, 11 year old twins, an eight year old and a four and a half year old. So we're kind of like into the point where we're all running in separate directions, my wife and I, at any given point during the day. Sure. And as a kid growing up, we always ate dinner together as a family. And so we shoot to do it as much as possible. There's some interesting research showing that family meal time is is an important one if you can lock it down. So some of the things we do, one of the things was introduced. I think it's also just a good time for us to connect as a group. David, who's my eight-year-old, he brought to the family one day something they do at school called Y'all Know What? Where he would, so for him, for example, would start out and he would just say, y'all know what? And then everybody would say, what, David? And then he would say, today, X, Y, Z happened. And then we would all go around the table. And so what's really interesting about it is it all, it happens now, like very organically. Like we don't necessarily do it every night, Mm -hmm. but all of a sudden, just one of the kids will blurt out, y'all know what? (laughs) You know what's happening. Yeah. And then everybody knows. And and the rules are when you're going to tell what happened, the piece of your day, that it's only like one or two sentences that no one else is allowed to comment. Like you're just supposed to listen. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And so then you can all go around the room. But like when our four year old will be sitting at the table and he'll be like, y'all know what? We're all like, oh, what, Joseph? And then, you know, he'll tell like some made up story about preschool. But (laughs) um, and then everybody goes around it. And that's like a really great conversation starter for us. You know, one of the other things like we do with food is I I would say pick like the term picky eater. I don't know. Like Mm. it's a weird term, but everyone has like things about food that they like and don't like. Mm hmm. I don't know if it's magnified when you're a child, but it just seems that way because you're not the one preparing the foods. I think it's probably the same with adults. Adults just steer clear of them without being brought to anyone's attention. So we have, you know, something like in our family is like, look, you don't have to like it, but you just got to try it and just keep Mm -hmm. trying, you know, and you can't say you don't like it if you've never had it. And so one of the things we try to do with dinners, like if we were to do salad night is somehow popular at our house or tacos are popular, but we, we would prepare foods where everything is separated in bowls or separate bowls or plates. And then everyone gets to serve themselves the amount and the different things that they want on their own plate. So it's kind of build their own. Yeah. So they get to build their own plate, um, which is a little different than like, this is dinner, this big thing. And now I'm going to put it on your plate. Mm -hmm. And so we try to do that as much as possible. And, you know, we found like, even with our son, who's, you know, has a little bit more strong food preferences that this has been a really good thing for him for us to be like, look, I just you just try it. If you don't like it, that's fine. But let's just keep trying it because your tastes are going to change and evolve. Mm-hmm. And if you're not in the habit of saying, let me give that a shot, you're going to end up eating the same four things your whole life. Yeah, I think it's more common for children to be in that super taster category. I think there's a new term for that now, but where vegetables taste more bitter to them. And I think as they age, that that changes. But this sort of family style service is the thing. A f- good friend and colleague of mine, Jill Castle, she's a pediatric dietitian. She's been on the show. She kind of smacked my hand a little bit because I was a food plater. And that's something that, you know, sometimes we tend to do. So I like the idea. It's not just family style in your house, but they get to build their own in a way. Like maybe they're building a taco or maybe they're building a salad or building a bowl or whatever. So it makes it even more fun. And, you know, and I think part of it is, it's like food culture and what they're exposed to as well. You know, what's consistent and what's normal for them. And and so, you know, with this the strength of field manual, it's like, you know, those cornerstones are the ones that we have tried to instill as like the food culture in our family. We always say to the kids, like, well, where are the vegetables? You know, what are you having for protein? And so that repetition, I think, is important. Absolutely. We, we do know that what children are exposed to at home is what's normal to them. It's their normal environment. And so that's how they tend to eat when they grow up and move away. They might go through that little phase where they rebel and, you know, eat completely differently, but they tend to come back home, quote unquote, to what's normal to them. Yeah, that's my hope. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, my daughter (laughs) is just going off to her second year of college and uh, she's doing great. And yeah, she's like, oh my gosh, mom, the food at the dorm isn't yours. And and I do have to brag a little. She said, you've ruined me for guacamole. I can't eat any guacamole if it's not yours. I'm like, well, thank you very much. That's a very nice compliment. I know. And of course, (laughs) I didn't know this till she went off to college. And that's when she realized it herself. But yeah, so she's, you know, using the the skills that that we raised her with. And um, it's working well for her. So, you know, there is hope uh, when those kids grow up and move on. But no, I am definitely going to try the y'all know what I think my family is going to love that. My daughter, when she was probably about 10, brought home the rosebud thorn, which I've talked about on the show before. But for those who haven't heard it, everybody tells their rose, which is the best thing that happened that day, their thorn, the worst thing that happened that day, and their bud, which is what they're looking forward to. So yeah, just sort of a way to kind of make it a little less like, so what's the best and the worst thing that happened today? I like that. What are you looking forward to? It's it's a great conversation starter and gives you a lot of insight into what's going on with your family. Yeah, no, that's, that is a great one. Well, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for all of the great information about Strength, the field manual. Um, like I said, I'll have the links and everything that we talked about in the show notes where people can get the digital book or order copies of the hard copy book, which is, it's a nice, it's, it definitely will fit in your backpack. It's about half the size of a sheet of paper, maybe a little bigger, a big enough to, you know, have some good 
visuals and stuff on there and it's uh spiral bound so i think people will really enjoy that but it's just a wonderful resource and i can tell you put a lot of heart and soul into it so thank you for writing it people can find you at your website which is com. you're on instagram at microcell and um i'll ha- like i said i'll have the links to the other things that we discussed including like the bold study and some of the other things maybe the, the other podcast episodes that i mentioned so thank you again is there anything else you wanted to share as we wrap up i appreciate you allowing me to kind of share this this message in the book with your audience um i enjoyed our conversation very much and you know i really do encourage people to go to the links and get the book when when I've, we were first planning the book and I was asking them, I'm like, well, what are we going to do with it? And they're like, we're just going to give it away. And I was like, wait, you're just going to give it away? And so, <laughs> so, so yeah, you know, like the physical book, I was surprised how great it looked. Like it, it's just a thick, hearty, like the stock in the book is is very nice. And and they did an amazing job on the graphics. So this is like par on the same style that of the my last book, which Men's Health published from a quality standpoint, but it's free. So, uh, so yeah, I definitely recommend people go pick it up. Well, thank you. And also, you have a podcast, The Dr. Mike Show. So I'll link to that in my show notes as well, or people can find that on whatever podcast app they listen to. And you've taken a little bit of a break because you were working on other projects, but you're getting back to it. So I look forward to subscribing and tuning into that as well. And Thanks again, Dr. Mike. It's been so great talking with you. I could talk to you for hours, but uh, I think we've stretched this uh, as long as I can take any more of your time. All right. And for everybody listening, as always, enjoy your food with health in mind and enjoy your life with strength in mind. Till next time. Thanks for staying tuned. As promised, here are some announcements from my partner, the American Association of Diabetes Educators. AADE 20 call for abstracts. You can submit your abstracts for the AADE 2020 conference, which will be held in Atlanta, Georgia, Friday, August 14th through Monday, August 17th. Submissions can be submitted online. The deadline for education and research sessions is October 21st, and the deadline for posts is June 30th, 2020. AADE also has a new podcast. I'm so excited about this. AADE is proud to bring you this new podcast for your personal and professional growth. It's called The Huddle, Conversations with the Diabetes Care Team, and it features perspectives, issues, and updates to inform your practice and elevate your role. Each episode dives into a variety of topics that directly impact your work in diabetes, prediabetes, and cardiometabolic care. Everything from advocacy to technology, to new ways to support your clients. The podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. And finally, AADE has developed several new handouts to help you address issues and manage them. There's handouts on diabetic ketoacidosis, hyperosmolar syndrome, sick day management for adults, and sick day management for children. You can find all of this information at diabeteseducator.org. And I will also have direct links to all of this information in my show notes at soundbitesrd.com forward slash 128. Thanks again for listening. Have a great day. For more information, visit soundbitesrd.com. Music by Dave Burke.